Now, I don't watch a lot of television because uh, uh, I'm busy, especially with the doctoral program, I'm really busy, so I, I don't watch that much. Uh, but I do find it interesting that when I do watch, I invariably see a pharmaceutical commercial. Have you seen these? Yeah. Are they not interesting? Yes. I'm like, if I owned a pharmaceutical company, I do not think I would show some of the ads that they show. Uh, because if you're thinking about it logically, they're not logical. Because whatever your malady is, uh, you take their particular pharmaceutical drug, there's so many issues that come with that drug, you just wouldn't take it, right? Am I right? And so the other day, I was watching another pharmaceutical ad, and I thought, that's unbelievable. And so what I, I've told you that you can use all kinds of things to learn spiritual lessons, correct? <laughs> Movies, whatever. You can even learn from a pharmaceutical uh, <laughs> commercial something spiritual. So what I'm going to do is just show you, what do they promise about how to fix your said issue, and then what are the detractions based on their promise? <laughs> then we'll come back and analyze it spiritually. That's what we do here at this church. <laughs> they analyze commercials. Here's a one to help you stop smoking. Herb quit smoking with Chantix and support. Talk to your doctor to find out if prescription Chantix is right for you. Guess not. <laughs> uh, my father, he smoked for 53 years. He started when he was 13. Uh, smoked all through the Korean War, and as a federal agent, he smoked uh, my whole life. We tried to get him to stop all the time. Dad, you kill yourself. Don't do this. After his first heart attack, he stopped because the, the sur surgeon told him, Mr. Baker, the chemicals that you're on for, uh, for your heart attack uh, are the best for getting off nicotine. So if you're going to do it, now's the time. So he quit. Uh, and uh, he was, I don't know, he didn't smoke anymore for, I don't know, another 15, 16 years. And he couldn't stand the smell afterwards. And he complained. And we're like, that's what we were saying all the time. But I would say to you, my dad as a federal agent was very good at analyzing things, you know, paying attention to the details. I think as a logical person, that commercial would not have convinced him to quit. Because all he would have done is listen to the first opening, oh, well, this can help you with your cravings, and then looked at, you can lose your eyesight, kidneys fail, nausea, psycho dreams, etc. <laughs> I know my dad. My dad was from South Carolina. He would have looked at it and said, son, that ain't working for me. You know, I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So what do they do? They tell you this glorious thing. You got a nicotine problem. Here, take this. This will help you. And then they, all these detractions. Now, we want to anal analyze that spiritually because you're thinking, what in the world? It is spiritual, isn't it? Okay, let's, let's flip it around, all right? When I watch those things, and I, there, you could, there's many you could choose from. I mean, there were so many. It's like, which one do I pick? They all do the same thing. People sailing, riding bikes, you know, skydiving. You know, take this, your life's going to look like that. Um, maybe your kidneys are failing as you're skydiving. Um, so <laughs> you, you try this three times. It's, it's the most interesting. Um, spiritually speaking, when I analyze it spiritually speaking, when I finish watching those things, I, I always ask myself, I would not ask myself, I make the following statement. I am so glad the gospel is not like that. Do you hear me? You know, could you imagine if the gospel was like that? Okay, so you got way more than a nicotine problem. Let's say you're, it's a spiritual problem. You're born dead spiritually. It's the way you come into the planet. Paul's going to talk about it in Romans chapter 5, 12 to 21. We're born that way. Okay, spiritual problem, spiritual death. How do I find spiritual life? What did Jesus say? Well, look at John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus puts the cookies on the lower shelf. If you've got a spiritual problem, What's, what's his ad? What's his product? What's he say? Truly, 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 I say to you, or you, you need to listen up. He, put your name in there, who hears my word, what I'm teaching about, uh, and believes in him, the Father, who sent me on this mission of redemption. If you believe that I'm the Messiah, the Son of God, come to be the Savior of the world, and my Father sent me on this mission to die for your sins, etc., all that the gospel is, when you believe that, what happens? What's he promise? Has, present tense, eternal life. And then he adds, and he does not come into judgment, like judgment when? Like when you stand before me. You, you'll either know me or you don't know me. On judgment day, I'll say, you're my child. Uh, and then he said, but you've passed out of death into life. Could you imagine if this was like a Chantix commercial? Could you imagine? You're automatically beginning to creatively think about the options. Oh, you want to leave spiritual death and, and find spiritual life? Hey, just believe in me as the Savior, and you'll find it. However, you must meditate two hours a day and listen to Gregorian chants. Uh, I'm out. Uh, you must never have a thought that's not holy. Uh, I'm out. Uh, you must uh, read your Bible like at least four or five times a week. Uh, probably going to be out. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you're convicted. That's what it is. Yeah. 
I mean, aren't you glad that the gospel is not like that? God gives you this wonderful promise with all these detractions. No, it's so simple that a child can get it or a person with a PhD from MIT, they can get it. So what is it? You're a sinner, you need a savior. When you come to the savior in faith, believing the evidence is true for yourself, he, he gives you eternal life. Biggest decision you'll ever make and there's no detractions from that. I don't know about you, but I'm excited because that's the gospel. Powerful. Now we were talking about this last week because it's part of Paul's... Uh, Credentials to the Roman church. And we want to review the, those credentials because he's telling them, if I come to your church and teach and preach, this is what I'm about. And so what we were covering last week in verse 3 was he was a purveyor of the gospel. That's, that's what he's about. And that was verse 3. But there's more to the purveying of the gospel as we're going to see. But before we look at it, we need to review what we talked about last week because brain cells die daily, don't they? Right. When I go to the Kennedy Center and I'm lost in the parking lot, I just take a picture a75. That's where we are, babe. And then we <laughs> find the car. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Haven't you lost your car at the Kennedy Center? Yeah. Or you come out of a football game and it's like, uh, where are we? Yeah. Anyway, take pictures. That's what your cell phone's for. But anyway, back to my sermon. So, so what we talked about last week, well, we talked about two things about the, being a purveyor of the gospel. The gospel is about the person of Jesus. He's the essence of the gospel. That's what verse 3 says. He says, this gospel is concerning his son. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. So he says the, the gospel is about the, the, the son of God. That's who it's about. He was the one born. He's the only one who could be born to take away our sin because only he could live a perfect life and bear our sin. Uh, and he came on that mission exclusively. Uh, Dr. Luke, writing around 62 AD, uh, some four years after the letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verse 12, he is a doctor, medical doctor, good at analysis of historical data. Uh, writes this about the personal work of Jesus. He says, there is, no salva there is salvation in no one else. He says, for there is no other name under heaven that has given among men by which they must be, not might be, must be saved. That's pretty exclusive. Because it is exclusive. Because only the Son of God could bear your sin on the cross, die and rise the third day, and provide salvation for you and me as sinners. That's exactly what he did. He's the person of the gospel. We talked about that last week. That he, but he was also uh, the descendant of David. And God narrows it down to say, the Savior, let me s tell you how specific it is. It's not only the Son of God, he's going to come through the Davidic line. Why? Because it's prophesied that he would come through the, the Davidic line. 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 89, Psalm chapter 2, etc. He'll be from the Davidic line. Read Matthew 1. It's the genealogy of Jesus to David to prove that he is indeed the Son of God. And he came from the Davidic line, which means it's very narrow who the Savior is, which means pick another religion, no matter what it is, whatever their holy books are. They are not the way to God because they're not by means of the Son of God, and they're not by means of the Davidic Son of God. He's the only King of Kings, period. Now we want to look at the power of the gospel to save somebody. That's what we want to study in verses 4 through 7. It's a powerful gospel. How do I know that? Well, what does he say? He says that this Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by what means? Power. Like what kind of power? Well, by means of the resurrection from the dead. According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, he's, the, the word spirit there is capitalized in the English text, but it's really uh, lowercase in the Greek text. And it's a, it's a decision based on a translator to either capitalize it or to make it small. I don't think it's the Holy Spirit being talked about here. I think it's the spirit of Jesus is holy. He's the one who is holy, the pneuma. He's the spirit, and he's holy. He's the one who is now declared to be the son of God by means of the resurrection. Now, what's interesting is the word declare. It's an articular, you, uh, articular. It's an article. has the word the. It's an articular um, participle denoting who Jesus is. He's the dec declared one. Uh, it comes from the Greek word horizo, from which we get our word horizon. Oh, this is interesting. What's that mean? It means by declaration, uh, horizo means to mark off the boundary of your property. So I, I told you a couple weeks ago when I first moved here, the first thing I did is I built a fence at my house. Remember? I told you this a couple sermons ago. And all my neighbors are freaking out. He must be from California. He's building a fence. Yes. And then they built fences. It was totally interesting. Um, but I mark, the first thing I did is I called Miss Utility. And what is my property? Where are, where's the you know, boundary markers? And so they came and marked off the property. Miss Utility came and told me where all the power lines are so I don't like kill myself. Uh, and that, then I start digging holes, you know, by hand. That's my property. That's horizo. It's, it's my horizon. When you're doing that, you're making a declaration. This is my turf. 
okay? This is my property. How is Jesus declared to be the son of God? He's the horizon, uh, as it were, because he's the boundary marker, meaning he's the only way to be saved from death, spiritual death, in the day of judgment. He's the only one who can grant you life. He's the horizon of this. He's the boundary of this. How do we know that? Because he says, Paul says, hey, I can personally tell you uh, this was demonstrated and validated by the resurrection from the dead. I mean, think about it. Who can reverse necrosis other than God? Now, I've been with a lot of people when they die um, over the years as a pastor, 30-something years. Uh, when my wife's twin sister died at nine, in 1993 at 33 years old from breast cancer, I was with her. I drove down the state of California with Liz, walked into the hospital. Mary Beth said, Marty, would you pray for me? I prayed for her, and that young woman uh, leaned back and died that moment. It was unbelievable. God kept her alive so we could pray for her and she could see her sister. It was unbelievable. But it didn't take long for necrosis to start to set in. Because you could just tell, uh, she who I had led to Christ several years before was now in his presence. And it was just a body. And I, you know, my dad, same thing. When he died of brain cancer, same thing. Uh, we were all holding hands when he walked into God's presence. And then after a few minutes, it was quite apparent that it's not dad. It's just a body. Where is he? He's, he's with the Lord himself. Imagine what he sees. And so when you, who can reverse necrosis? We can't. There is no way. But God can. So when Jesus died, he wants to validate that he is indeed God in the flesh. So how does he do it? In a way that blows our minds. He defeated death. He defeated death. Now it was prophesied that he would do it in Psalm 16.8. It's a messianic song of, Psalm of David. Where David says, by way of prophecy, which is applied to Jesus later, for thou, God, will not abandon my soul to Sheol, the Old Testament version of the grave, neither wilt thou allow thy Holy One, the Messiah, to undergo decay. So what happened to Jesus? He dies by crucifixion, public execution. Everybody saw it. Uh, they uh, verify his death, uh, stick a spear in his side to see the, the water, the blood to come out. Uh, they go to break his legs to uh, hasten his, his death, but they don't break his legs uh, because he was already dead and the executioners knew that, etc. He was very dead based on the crucifixion model of the Romans. And they put him in a tomb. But then three days later, he, he reverses necrosis and rises. We'll talk more about that in just a minute, but that's the ultimate proof that he's in God in the flesh because he overcame death itself, death itself, by his bodily resurrection. Now, he prophesied that he was going to do this. Um, uh, my Islamic neighbor that wanted to know a couple years ago, is Jesus a prophet? Answer. Is he a prophet? No, he's the prophet. He's, the, he's not a prophet. He's the prophet. What did he prophesy? Uh, well, he prophesied that he was going to die and three days later rise again. Now, you can say that all day long. You can't pull it off, right? If you think you can, I got numbers you need to call. You could not. So what did Jesus say? Matthew 12. Notice what Jesus said when he was very much alive. He tells the unbelieving Jews who needed some proofs of who he was, you would think that miracles that he's producing that you're watching would be enough evidence but you know people that don't want to bow to god think of all kinds of reasons i need more evidence and he says but he answered and he said to them an evil and an adulterous generation craves for a sign he's speaking to the spiritual leaders yet no sign shall be given it but the sign of the prophet jonah oh he's going back to the prophets the nebaim yeah we know what he's talking about he's talking about jonah and the, it wasn't a whale was it no in hebrew it's just dag dag is a fish. So, so it's either a really big fish, uh, we don't know what kind of fish that swallowed him, or Jonah was a really little dude. What, I don't know which one it is, <laughs> but he got swallowed. And we all know this. Jesus said, oh, you want a sign of who I am? I'll give you one. Hey, you remember the story of Jonah? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What happened? You know, God told him to go to Nineveh, Nineveh to witness to the Assyrians. He doesn't like the people of, he didn't like them, he doesn't want to touch their soil. He runs the opposite direction, gets in a boat, starts sailing for like Spain, Tarshish. God sends a storm providentially. All the sailors are polytheistic. They think the gods have been angered. Who's, who's responsible? They cast lots. God controls the lots. It falls on Jonah. He comes clean. I'm running from God. He wants to be a missionary to the Assyrians. He, then what's he say? Read chapter one. Throw me overboard. He, they throw him overboard. Glassy sea the minute he hits the water. <laughs> and he's gone. Did you see that? That dude is gone. The fish took him. Except... Where do, he's, going, he's going west. Where'd the fish go? East. Due east. Good thing to do God's will. He goes east. He swims back to the Mediterranean coastline. Somewhere along you know, the coastline, he spits, the fish spits out Jonah, and then he's all ready to go do the will of God. <laughs> That's a whole other sermon. 
And if you think the Bible's boring, you haven't read it. You know? And Jesus says, you want a sign? It's going to be like Jonah. They're thinking, what is he talking about? A fish is going to swallow him. He's on land. How's that going to happen? Well, you know, hey, what's he say? For just as Jonah uh, was uh, three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man, which is code word of Jesus from Daniel chapter 7, I think verse 13, uh, he will, he'll be uh, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Oh, he's not talking about a fish. What's he talking about? Well, he's telling you, uh, just as Jonah looked like he died when he went into the fish and was resurrected, uh, uh, you know, day three, uh, that's going to happen to me. I'm going to die and raise from... Did they believe it? Nope. Nope. Has God ever told you something and you just didn't quite get it? You're not getting what I'm talking about right now. So, yeah. <laughs> John chapter 2. What does he say? Jesus. Uh, the Jews therefore answered and said to him, uh, we need another sign. Uh, what sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? I mean, come on. I mean, you're doing miracles and stuff, but like, how do we know you're from God? He goes, uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, okay, uh, we're, in, you know, we're in Jerusalem and uh, you know the temple and everything. Let, let's talk about it. Here's a sign. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews therefore said, you can just imagine talking amongst themselves sarcastically. It took 46 year, years, like for Herod, to build this temple where the stones, I've seen them when I take people to Israel, the stones are 40 to 60 tons per piece and you can't hardly put a piece of paper in between them. Huh? It took 46 years to build this, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Oh, come on. There's no way. There's no way. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples connected the dots. I just added that to the Bible. He, he remembered that he said this. And they had, as a group of men, one of those aha moments. Hey, do you remember? Remember what he said? He did it. Only God could do that. See, they had seen the physical resurrection of Jesus. They had seen him. Remember? They had more than just seen him. I mean, they'd be in a locked room and he would appear post-resurrection. I mean, that would get your attention. And then he'd disappear. He cooked them breakfast on the beach in Galilee. Unbelievable. Uh, they could touch him. They could see the wounds from the crucifixion. It was a bodily resurrection. He had reversed necrosis. It was the ultimate illustration that he was quite alive. And that he was God, the God of the gospel. Who else saw Jesus? A whole bunch of people. Uh, well, 12 times to be exact, he appeared before he ascended. Mary saw him first, John 20. Then Mary and some women. Uh, then Peter. Then two disciples. Then 10 apostles. Then seven apostles. And then 500 people at one time. Well, it was a hallucination. Uh, no, really, mass hallucination of that nature. Uh, uh, James, his brother, then saw him, 1 Corinthians 15. All the apostles saw him on his ascension, uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. And then Paul, the persecutor of the church, eventually ran into the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. All those people saw Jesus, and many of them died for what they saw. It radically changed them because they had seen him risen. Now think about his brother James. James, the brother of Jesus. If your brother came to you and told you, mom and dad have kept us from you, but I just want to let you know that I am God. <laughs> Balcony, are you listening to me? Like, how would that go over for you? They're super spiritual up there. I mean, how would that go over? Or would you believe them? And there's, there's no way. Now, prove it. You know, uh, James did not believe that his brother Jesus, his older brother Jesus, was God. He didn't believe it. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says Jesus personally appeared to his brother James, and when he appeared to his brother James, his brother believed the evidence and followed his brother as Messiah. That's all it took. Can you imagine that conversation? It must have been awesome when James, the unbeliever, sees his brother Jesus, knowing that he was crucified by the Romans, knowing that they put him in that tomb. He's now looking at him face to face. And he says, you know, James, I died for you too, man. I am the Messiah. And his brother turns to him and embraces him as Savior. How do you get your brother to change from unbelief to belief? You show him the evidence. See, Jesus was resurrected. He was resurrected. And what's really interesting, not only is that recorded in the Bible, and you could say, well, if you're an attorney, well, he just uses his own book to proof, proof text the fact that he was resurrected. Okay. Well, go outside the Bible. 
and read all kinds of other writers who validate the fact of a variety of things, and I have a matrix I can show you, of, uh, that he had disciples, that they did die for their faith, uh, that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, Thallus, the Roman historian, 52 AD, says there was, 52 AD, 20 years after the death of Christ in 32 uh, AD, says there was a blackness of, around the earth on the day that, that, that Christ figure died. Yeah, that's exactly what the scriptures say. Suetonius, Trajan, Hadrian, uh, Pliny the Younger, uh, uh, Josephus in the Antiquities, they talk about the Christ and his disciples and his person and his work. Because he, he did die and rise again. And that's the evidence of the faith. They saw him. That powerful scene of him radically changed them forever. Do you know the power of that gospel? They say it's the power. It takes a dead man, makes him a spiritually alive man. That's the power of the gospel. Paul says, if I come to your church, I'm going to showcase the power of the gospel of Christ. Big time. There's also a provision of the gospel. It's not only powerful, it provides many things. Notice what verse 5, what it provides. He says, through whom, Jesus, we have received two things. What does he, re- he say we have received? Two things. Two th- grace and apostleship. Uh, to do what? What's the purpose of receiving those two things? Well, the purpose is to bring about the obedience of faith among who? Gentiles. Why should we do this? For the, his name. For his namesake. Uh, who is he talking about? Uh, is he talking about all believers? I don't think so. Because not all believers are apostles. We are in the sense that we're sent, but we're not apostles. I think he's using the we language, the plural there, to refer to the apostles. And he's saying we as apostles have received two things specifically from God. Number one, grace. And number two, apostleship. And they come in that order. Why? Because you can't be an apostle chosen by God and sent on a mission for God unless you understand the grace of God. See, the grace of God that saves you. And Paul says, you know, as an apostle, if anybody understands the grace of God, I do. Because remember what he did for a living before he got saved? He was a killer, a murderer of Christians. Acts chapter 22, he recounts his story this way, verse 4. He says, "Uh, I persecuted this way. The way is what Christians were called, people of the way. Because Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, To death. Uh, I was binding them. I was putting them, both men and women, into prisons. As also the high priests and all of the council, that's the Sanhedrin or the Jewish version of the Supreme Court, of the elders, they can testify. This is what I did. I was their hit man. Anybody that left Judaism and embraced Christ as the Messiah, I hunted them down, we imprisoned them, and we executed them. I was the man who did this. And he said, uh, he said, for I received of them, the Supreme Court, I also received letters to the brethren, and I started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there, the Jews who converted, uh, to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished, to be executed. That's what I did. Now, now you would think, if in your carnal mind, you would think, if you're God, and you see uh, Paul going to Damascus to round up more men, women, and children who become Christians to uh, eradicate them, you would think that at your disposal are probably a couple of lightning bolts. I'm just saying. And you probably look down for him and go, okay, I am taking him out. Boom. He's gone. God looks down from heaven and what's he say? I died for that man, that persecutor. And I'm, I'm going to appear to that man and show him I'm quite alive. I'm resurrected. And I'm going to call him to follow me. See, the love of God, the grace of God stretches across all sin down to a person who's a murderer like Paul. Paul said, and Paul's like, well, what happened? He says in Acts 22, it came about that it was so on my way to approaching Damascus, about noontime, you know, when the sun's really bright, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Every time you kill a Christian woman, a Jew who's converted to me, you are attacking me. Every time you take out an old man who's left Judaism to embrace me as the Messiah, you're taking out me. Every time you attack a child, you're attacking me. This is the danger of persecution, is it not? Because you are really attacking a child of God. It's it's as if you're attacking him. Jesus says, Paul, you you need to stop this. And he said to me, he said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus. In case you don't know who that might be, Paul, remember, I'm from Nazareth. I'm the Nazarene, uh, and uh, you are persecuting me. I'm whom you are persecuting His life was never the same because what happened that day on the road? He understood grace, that that Savior saved even him. He got to Damascus, a whole new man. You know, you might be on the Damascus road angry at God, 
And God's opening the heavens to show you who he is through his powerful resurrection, the proofs thereof. And he's, he's reaching out to you. What's he doing? Well, he's telling you, I, I, I want to save you. My grace is sufficient even for you. And Paul said, he saved me. And I became his apostle to do what verse 5 says he did. To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. He says, I live to lead Gentiles who don't know God to God. That's what I live for. When I was a little kid, uh, I paid attention, even though my parents probably thought I wasn't paying attention. Uh, when we used to sing hymns all the time, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. What's he doing? He's calling for you and for me. See, at the, see all the portals. He's waiting, he's watching, watching for you and for me. What's he saying? Come home, come home. All you who are weary, come home. I knew I was weary as a child, even then, of sin. And the day I came to know Christ, you could just feel the burden gone. See, that's the grace of God. He saved even me, even me. That's what Paul's saying. I want to come talk to you about grace. Verses 6 to 7, he looks at those the saints at that church, and he says, let me tell you something else you've got through the gospel. He says, among whom you, Jesus has also given you, the fact that he's called you. He's called you. I want to ask you a theological question. It's probably going to mess up your lunch. Uh, does God select people from, for heaven? Ooh. What's that say? Among whom you and Rome are the called of Jesus Christ. Does, people, does God call people to be believers? Absolutely he does. So if you were to, if, so Marty's asking a trick question. No, I'm not. So think about it this way. Uh, if you were to ask, hey, Marty, do you believe in uh, an election? Yes. Do you believe in predestination? Yes. Do you believe in free will? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Can you tell me how they, they all work together? No. <laughs> and I don't say that to be funny, but it, no, I can't. No. Beca- because it's, it's, it's not an enigma. It's an antinomy in philosophy. You cannot solve it. The greatest minds can't solve it. And you would kind of understand if it's from God, it must be beyond comprehension. He created us with free will, says, he, says we have it. But he also tells us in passages like this, he chooses people. He calls them. How does he do that? How does, how does he call? Well, if you want to get into the theology of it, there's what is called the general call. The general call is general revelation. What's that? That's Romans 1.18. We'll get there in a few weeks. God willing. Um, Romans 1.18. It tells you, you look around at the cosmos around you, and I see intricate design, so I must think by definition, intricate design speaks of intricate designer. I look at the human eye, and I understand it, is, it possesses irreducible complexity, that there is no way in an evolutionary expansion of time, no matter how much time, it cannot function. It's complex and it's irreducibly complex. Blah, blah, blah. Points to God. Tells me there is a God. Doesn't necessarily tell me which God there is, but there is a God, a living God. Now, general revelation tells me that. Special revelation well, it tells me which God that is. And how do we know the Bible is special revelation? Another sermon series in and of itself. But as I've told you many times before, prophecy validates the Bible as being the book from God because only God could know time. And I've given you all the stats in the last couple of sermons, just the prophecies of Christ being fulfilled. Statistically, mathematically, impossible for Jesus to fulfill those if he was not God. So does God call people? Absolutely. Uh, what is, how does he call them? Well, this is called, in theology, the, the, theological terms, the effectual call. That's what saves you. See, because like in John, Jesus says, no man can come to the Father except for the Father draws them. And I knew back in 1967 when he was drawing me. I totally knew. In fact, I went to the pastor to tell him, I might be nine years old, but this is what's going on in my life. Could you explain this? And he goes, well, well Marty, God, God's talking to you. Yeah, I, he is. And I, and I came to faith. I, 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 I received the internal call of God uh, in a sermon based on uh, the, old, the old hymn, Just As I Am. I think there's like six verses. I mean, and in a Baptist church, they would sing it like 12 times, you know. And the day, that I, the, the, the day that, I, that I responded to the general call, to the internal call, was the day I knew that it was true for me. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And, and I went forward on Just I Am. I don't even know how many, like the, the second time through, verse 6, whatever. Just as I am without one plea, but what? what is, what's the rest of it? Do you know it? Do you know it? I don't know it. I'm twice asking you, so, yeah. You know, I, I was listening to that song. You know, I come, I come to you. Romans 3.20, or Revelation 3.20 was what got my attention for just as I am. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
God knocks. If any man hears my voice and comes to the door and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. You know what? I figured out that I was a sinner in need of a savior and the gospel's powerful. That day I opened that door in 1967, it was the day he came in never to leave. And I know from that day forward, I mean, how do you know you're an elect person? Receive the call. Then you know you're his. And I've, ne- I've always known that call has been on my life ever since I was a little kid. Because I knew he specifically called me into his kingdom. And if you're a believer, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. It's that mysterious side of the faith. You believe the evidence is true for you. Is the day you move from sin, well, to, to sainthood. He talks about this as he closes in verse 7. Notice what he says. He says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as what? Saints. saints. Called to saints. The, he says, you Romans have two things about you that I know. Number one, God loves you and he loves your church. And number two, he's, in some translations read called to be saints, which is erroneous translation. In Greek, it's just called saints. Well, what's that mean? That means I was born a sinner But in 1967, I became a saint. I didn't have to do special religious works, uh, do miracles or thereof, uh, do certain kinds of regimen religiously. The minute I, as a young boy, trusted the gospel, I had life and sainthood. I was a saint. Do you realize you're high and holy calling? You are a saint. Now you are. One day you'll shine bright as the sun in God's presence because you're a saint, because he gave you the righteousness that came only from Christ. What does it mean to be a saint? Hagios means to be set apart. And indeed, you should be as a Christian, set apart to God and his purposes. Paul says, uh, I want to come to a church to talk to saints about how to reach sinners. That's what we're about as a church because the gospel is powerful and our old world needs it. If you are not a believer today, we have counselors off to the side. They would be glad if you can say, God's knocking on the heart of my door of my house. They will be glad to introduce you to him in prayer. And this could be your spiritual birthday like no birthday you've ever had. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the credentials of Paul, the passion that he had, one giant long sentence of his love of you, love of the gospel, and desire to preach that and teach that to those who needed it. Might our lives showcase the grace of Christ that that loves all sinners and cares for them and desires for them to be saved. And might we be those who articulate the gospel to those in our lives. Pray for those among us that don't know you. Uh, You do what you do best. You draw them unto yourself. And might they hear your tender voice softly calling to them to come home. And might they do that today in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful week.